from this morning's epistle reading. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So far God's word. Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Amen. We have four children. Now when they were young, just entering their school years, we encouraged them to try things to see what they might like to do. We didn't really care what sports or hobbies they might gravitate toward. We just wanted them to do something other than sitting around watching TV. Now since we didn't have a lot of money, the rule was that they could do one thing that we would pay for. There was one sport, however, that we had every one of them attempt. Soccer. And that's because there was an inexpensive group called Fair, Fun, Positive Soccer. What we liked is the fact it was a non-competitive club. Everyone got to play. Everyone played every position on the field. They, every few minutes, changed positions and played the whole game. There were no scoreboards. No one was supposed to be keeping score. And the teams were randomly put together. There was no draft as the coaches tried to get the better players like the competitive programs. And while they would let a friend or two play upon request, the kids were simply generally assigned to teams by a blind draw. Once again, the coaches had nothing to do with it. All the players were considered to be equal playing on a level field, so to speak. Now that didn't mean that there were never teams that turned out better than the rest. I mean, over the course of a season, a good coach could create a good team which would wind up beating all the other teams. And if such a team was really good that day and were running away with the game score, which of course no one was supposed to be keeping score of, wink, wink, nod, nod, they would just simply take a player off the field and play shorthanded. I'll never forget when one of our girls was playing on one of those good teams and was asked to sit out. And she put her hands on her hips and says, well, it's not my fault they're that bad. In other sports, there are similar rules. They're often referred to as mercy rules. In Little League, I remember the 10-run mercy rule that ended a game when one team was 10 runs ahead. In fact, I remember playing one of the shortest games of baseball I can recall when we lost after only two innings, 13 to zero. When it comes to living the perfect life as required by God's law, aren't we thankful for his mercy rules like today's? For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Though God's law is anything and everything that he commands us and expects of us, we best know it in the words of the Ten Commandments. The whole will and desire of God's heart is revealed in how he wants us to deal with him, but how he also wants us to deal with one another as Jesus taught. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Love God, love others, repeat. Now God gives us his law and he expects us to keep it perfectly all the time, 24 7 52. His expectation is simple, be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. And again, the Bible teaches us that whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. To be perfectly holy and acceptable to God demands that we be perfectly righteous in everything we think, we say, we do. Every single moment of every single day. And so for us, the law is a death sentence as we stand before the judgment seat of God since the wages of sin is death. If you do not, cannot, will not obey God's law and do everything he demands you to do, there's nothing but hell in your future. Fear God and keep his commandments, the wisdom writer proclaims. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. God's law sets a high standard humankind cannot meet. 
That fact, however, has not kept others from trying to earn their spot in heaven. So if you would, please turn to Romans chapter 9. We're going to pick up at verse 30. Paul writes, What then shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, that is, a righteousness that is by faith, but that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone as it is written. Behold, I'm lying, laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And whoever believes in him shall not be put to death. In the preceding verses, Paul has described God's sovereign choice to extend his grace and mercy to those who are not my people, I will call my people. And to her who is not beloved, I will call beloved. Though God had established his people Israel as the apple of his eye, they were supposed to live righteously before the Gentile nations in order to point them to the Lord God, not to prove their worth, not to earn their spot. Now the Gentiles did not follow God's law until they came to faith, as Paul points out. But with faith came righteousness. Israel at the same time, however, pursued righteousness by their own works, depending upon their own efforts rather than by faith. And thus they stumbled over the atonement that God had made possible through the cross of his son Jesus. You see, sometimes our best efforts lead to our worst mistakes. Early on in the church's history, there is a group of people who followed Pelagius, a heretical teacher who argued against the biblical teachings of original sin and the universal sinful nature of humankind. The Pelagius, Pelagians argued that people are basically good and that God readily accepts their goodness and welcomes them into his kingdom because of their goodness. The early church father, St. Augustine, argued conversely, saying, quote, if natural ability through the free will is enough for learning how one ought to live and for living aright, then Christ died in vain. Then the offense of the cross has been made void. Good works are not done in pursuit of grace. Rather, good works proceed from a heart of faith that trusts in God's grace in Jesus so that whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. We pick back up at chapter 10, verse 1. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear witness that they have a seal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now let's consider first of all what God is not saying here. Namely, that Jesus is at the end of the law, period. That's how some people want to read that last verse. As if to suggest that because of Jesus' atoning sacrifice upon the cross and the subsequent forgiveness of our sins by God, that we no longer have to follow God's will and way as it's expressed in the law. No, what Paul does say is that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. That is to say that the law is not dismissed by the cross, but its requirements for humankind are met and satisfied at the cross through the sacrificial death of Jesus. The Bible specifically teaches that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. The power of the gospel is in its declaration of what God has done for us in Jesus. That we are freed from the guilt and the punishment and the power of sin. That we are saved eternally because of Christ keeping the law and suffering and his death for us. As Paul writes to the Colossians, God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and has brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The righteousness of God 
is his holiness that he places upon us by his grace through Jesus. We who all on our own are not holy are made holy by God's righteousness, not our own. This is what those who try to impress God with their good works and their adherence to the law will never understand. If it's all about Jesus, it's not about me. And it is all about Jesus as the Bible declares. God made Jesus who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In the so-called game of life, humankind was striking out and the score was running way out of hand. And that's when God decided to apply his mercy rule. Peter tells us, you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Christ is the end of the law when it comes to that absurd notion that somehow sinners could ever keep God's law perfectly and prove themselves to be holy in God's sight. The righteousness of God is not something we attain, but that which only God can and does give us. You need to understand, as the Bible tells us, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And because of that, you can live in the peace and the hope that God intends for all of us to have in His grace through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And what more can we say to God then? Thanks be to God. And all God's people said, Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith unto Christ, unto life everlasting. Amen. We rise.